The president of the International Olympic Committee, Thomas Bach, made a big speech at the IOC session in Lausanne. He devoted a lot of time to the removal of Russia. Why are our athletes not at international competitions and when will they return there? We started our 139th session in Beijing in February this year. It wasn't that long ago, but how much our world has changed since then. Unfortunately, I have to start by stating my point of view on our actions in connection with the Russian special operation in Ukraine. Give peace a chance was my call to political leaders around the world at the opening and closing of the 2022 Games. As it turned out, the Beijing Olympics were just a fleeting moment of hope that peace and the Olympic truce would prevail. Unfortunately, we could only call because our relations with the political leadership of Russia have deteriorated sharply in recent years. The situation worsened after the doping scandal, cyber attacks and even personal threats against representatives of the IOC and the Olympic movement. Since the appeal was ignored, the IOC and the Olympic movement took immediate action after Russia, with the support of Belarus, launched this operation. The position of the Olympic movement is set out in my message, Give Peace a Chance, which was distributed around the world, it was appreciated by governments and organizations. The Olympic movement strongly supported this message, following the recommendations everywhere and expressing its support again last week during conversations with representatives of national Olympic committees, international federations and athletes. I would like to once again express our deep appreciation for this support. Our actions are twofold. On the one hand sanctions, on the other protective measures. We condemn the blatant violation of the Olympic truce. Sanctions have been imposed against the Russian and Belarusian authorities and governments that are responsible for the situation. They recommended not to hold international sports tournaments in Russia and Belarus, we banned the display of national symbols, for the first time in history, we even revoked the Olympic orders that were awarded to the President and Deputy Prime Minister of Russia. At the same time, we have taken protective measures to ensure the integrity of international competitions. To do this, we recommended that Russian and Belarusian athletes and officials should not be allowed to participate in international competitions or, at least, prohibit any identification of their nationality. I would like to emphasize once again that these protective measures are not sanctions, they are protecting the integrity of the competitions. It was impossible to guarantee the safety of Russian and Belarusian athletes and officials because of the deep anti-Russian and anti-Belarusian sentiments in many countries. We had to act quickly because it was obvious that the governments wanted to decide who and in which international tournaments could participate. And it concerned not only the authorities of the countries hosting the competitions. There are governments that prohibit their athletes from participating in any competitions with Russian and Belarusian athletes. There are governments that threaten to deprive any athlete who performs in such competitions of funding. There are governments that exert public and political pressure on national Olympic committees and sports federations. We have considered and continue to consider the situation taking into account the consequences. Today it is Russia and Belarus, but if we do not act, then tomorrow the government of country A will be against a participation of athletes from country B. Or government C will require its athletes not to compete with athletes from country D, and so on. It would be a situation contrary to all our principles. If the decision on who participates in which competitions is in the hands of politicians, then the non-discriminatory basis of our global sports system will disappear. It would be a complete politicization of sports. This would mean that sports and athletes would become an instrument of political sanctions. This was and remains our dilemma. Because of this dilemma, we had to take these protective measures, albeit with a very heavy heart. After our sanctions and protective measures, we received questions from two sides. The first question is, why did we react to this situation differently than to many others around the world? There are two answers to this. First, what is happening in Ukraine is different in that it is a blatant violation of the Olympic truce. Secondly, the far-reaching political, social and economic consequences make this a turning point in world history. The second question is, why are our sanctions limited to the government and national symbols and not applied to all members of the Russian Olympic community? Answer, according to the international rule of law, sanctions can and should be applied only to those who are responsible for something. 
the special operation was not started by the Russian people, not by Russian athletes, not by the Russian Olympic Committee, and not by the IOC members from Russia. Imagine what such a precedent would lead to. Every person, every athlete, every sports official, every sports organization would be punished for any illegal political actions of their governments. Justice cannot be achieved if you draw everyone with one brush. It would even be counterproductive because it would play into the propaganda of those who claim that sanctions are just part of a larger conspiracy directed against their country. By the way, our approach corresponds to the approach of governments, which are also bound by the rule of law when it comes to their sanctions measures. They also cannot apply sanctions to individuals only for a certain passport. Therefore, we are closely monitoring those who support this special operation with their statements or actions and incur the necessary consequences. For example, this was demonstrated by the International Swimming Federation, FINA, and the International Gymnastics Federation, FIG, which imposed sanctions on athletes who expressed support. At the same time, we must understand that in Russia, in such circumstances, silence in itself can be a message. Our guiding principle is peace. The Olympic Games, which unite the entire planet in a peaceful competition, is a powerful symbol of peace. But in order to unite the entire planet, Olympic sport needs the participation of all athletes who accept the rules, even, and especially, if their countries are in a confrontation or in a state of war. Competition between athletes only from like-minded countries is not a reliable symbol of peace. And this, of course, does not correspond to our mission. Our founder Pierre de Caubertin said. In truth, the whole work of the Olympic Games is based on consent, which means erasing memories of old battles or preventing new ones. While our actions have brought clarity to all stakeholders of the Olympic movement and helped preserve our unity, they have also highlighted the dilemma we are facing. At the moment we cannot fully fulfill our mission to unite the entire planet in a peaceful competition. Therefore, we are preparing for the day when peace will reign. Hopefully soon. There will come a time when the world will need to build bridges. When this moment comes, we in the Olympic movement need to prepare to solve the current dilemma and unite the whole planet in a peaceful competition again. Our Olympic mission is not a political mission. Our Olympic mission is a humanitarian mission. Because of this humanitarian mission, of course, we are painfully aware that there are too many conflicts in the world. We are all equal in our Olympic community, so everyone affected by the war deserves our attention and support. This is what we are doing at the Olympic Asylum Foundation. We support all members of the Olympic community suffering from wars and conflicts. Take Afghanistan as an example. We also had to act quickly there after the humanitarian crisis that unfolded after the change of political power. Thanks to the demonstration of real solidarity, with the active support of national Olympic committees and international federations, we have ensured the safety of about 300 members of the Afghan Olympic community. Together with UNHCR, Office of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees, we have supported about 2,000 members of the country's Olympic community. This humanitarian mission extends to members of the Olympic community of Ukraine. As in Afghanistan, our humanitarian assistance to Ukraine goes beyond financial support. We are amazed by the outpouring of solidarity. I would like to thank everyone in our Olympic community who makes a generous contribution. In addition to purely financial support, we offer logistical assistance. We make sure that Ukrainian athletes continue to participate in competitions. We provide transportation support, training facilities, accommodation, inventory and equipment. We will continue to support Ukrainian and Afghan athletes in the same way as we support other members of the World Olympic community affected by conflicts 